transition is about climate change. And the transition is inevitable, whether we are ready or not. The world is going to is from dependence on fossil fuels, the renewable energy, some other form of energy, whether we are ready or not. But what is not inevitable is the justice. We said just transition. The solution is inevitable, but the justice is not. And so our challenge to ensure that the transition does not only just happen, but that it is just. And this was echoed in all the initial statements we heard this morning. And we're hoping that we're going to go forward with that. So I'm very happy now to move to the energy expert, the executive director of Clean Tech, uh, Hop, uh, this is a former Malo. And now, what I would like to, uh, I would like you to help us get a hang on is whether this energy transition package that Nigeria has announced would, how do you believe or how would it affect our economy? Would it bring about an economic system that is respectful of nature or would it be one that, could, that seeks to commodify nature, to make nature something put on the market shelf? How would it help us to build a truly green economy? I think you're, you're very correct in your um, articulation of net zero, meaning that there has to be some sort of trade-off. A uh, trade-off between who is polluting more versus who is polluting less. Um, and I know that that's where a lot of activists tend to have issues with the conversations or the nomenclature around net zero and the framing of decarbonization right now. So you're correct in that. But when you look at the, the Nigerian uh, just transition plan, energy transition plan, sorry, it is a very ambitious plan. Um, and it is right to be ambitious because what you said earlier about this energy transition happening anyway is already happening. So it is important that Nigeria is a part of that conversation, even today. Um, the targets that they have set, I think, when we look at the range of targets from other countries, are very realistic. Um, because even wealthier countries and countries that have everything it takes to, to achieve net zero today are setting these sort of targets, um, saying that they need time to transition both their people and their economy to something that is much more sustainable. So for those of us in countries that are still developing and don't have all of those infrastructure, there is a case to be made that we need time also to transition. But then the question that you're asking about what the benefits are for us, here is how I'll frame it, even though I don't work for the government. It's the, it's the fact that we have a comparative advantage um, in the fact that we Still, we still have a struggling electricity system. And if we had to just take a sort of, uh, we have to take a sort of, you know, uh, poll here to ask people, how many people even get up to three hours of electricity from the grid? How many people, I just want to see hands up. Do you get up to three? No. No, everybody says no. Oh, some people, please, we have to find out where those people live so that we can, we can go see whether we'll find houses there. But that, that, this is just to say, somebody said Kubwa, okay. It's all right, it's all right, thank you. Okay, so the, the point is really that our electricity, um, the average of, uh, our average electricity consumption as Nigerians, as everyday Nigerians, are very low. And most times we're, we're subsidizing or, you know, um, getting most of our electricity through generators, diesel generators or petrol generators, there I better pass my, my labor generator. So we, we don't have enough electricity as it is. What this energy transition plan now does for us is to help us accelerate to a time where we can be able to get as much electricity as everybody else who's also going to be transitioning at the same time. Nigeria already is revolutionizing in, in terms of um, renewable energy. We have a mini grid regulation, we have mini grid, um, we have solar home system plants, um, we have the Solar Niger program, you know, they have a lot of programs that they, they are rolling out. The reason is because they want, they know that decentralized renewable energy is a way to get villages and communities electrified as quickly as possible without necessarily waiting for the antiquated grid that we have now to get to people. 
And so this is important for us when we're talking about the energy transition plan because it's going to maybe help with equalizing our energy access for millions of people who live in rural communities and peri-urban communities that do not have electricity today. So that's one advantage. The other advantage that I think this has is that it's also preparing our young people and it's really great, like His Royal Majesty said when he looked across the room and said that there are lots of young people here. It, it is really great that young people are engaging on issues of climate because it's the, the, their future. Um, but this future, there's going to be a green economy or a green future that is emerging. Do we have the human capital currently to out of that green, green future? The answer is no. So what again this plan might do for us is to begin to prepare young people to begin to think about um, technical knowledge in issues around you know, climate resilience, climate, climate adaptation, climate technologies, things that we're not actually very strong in now. So this, that's the other um, advantage that I see that this plan brings forth. I'm happy to talk about others, but I'll cede the mic back to you in a Thank you so much, Informa. But well, we do know that natural gas or fossil gas produces much uh, methane, which is much more dangerous than carbon dioxide, even if it doesn't last for a longer period as long in the atmosphere. So, um, clearly, gas is not a clean energy source. It may be what's available in Nigeria, but to say that this is a clean uh, bridge fuel is just uh, announcing that we're going to use what we have. Now, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not asking a person level to comment on it. My question really is, if this transition plan is built mostly on the hope of getting private sector investment, how would this energy provision be accessible, inclusive, and affordable? Trust Nemo to ambush, ambush people on the panel. Um, but Nemo, let me also just pick up on two things. Something you had said earlier, and I think something Larry has alluded to, and also um, all of the other panelists have alluded to. When we started the panel, you said that it was just because there was gender balance sort of in the panel. Um, but I think beyond the gender balance, I like the fact that there is community representation here today. Very often when we have this sort of forums, we leave our communities behind. But what this has done is to bring the voices of community into the room to be a part of this conversation. And I think, I think the organizers, uh, Ome, Fiora Dua Center, Ford, deserve an applause for that because we don't often, we don't often see that. And, and this occurred to me even before I knew what uh, Nemo was going to be asking because when I listened to both of them speak, um, I thought it was powerful for us to hear what their concerns were so that when those of us in government, those of us in private sector, or those of us that are in, in NGOs, um, are thinking about how we address these issues, we actually have the communities at the forefront of our design. So when we talk of design thinking and we're, we're designing interventions, we know that it is the communities that are going to be impacted um, that should be the ones who, whose voices are loudest in terms of how the output is. So thank you for that. Now to then answer your question about whether it's just private sector. I don't think it should be only private sector. In fact, I think you know the private sector should just be an enabler like government um, and have, or rather not an enabler, but just be a participant or a promoter like government. Um, but have a, a very integrated, we should have a very integrated approach on how we address issues of energy transition in order for it to be just. It is important that for it to be just, we let communities lead. If we're going to have a just transition in terms of this energy transition plan, it is important to let communities lead. And what do I mean by that? Um, Chief here has talked about, you know, the, what they're experiencing in Ogoni land um, and how their lands have been destroyed. There's a lot of work now that is going on around um, climate uh, uh, smart agriculture, um, agroecology, agroeconomy. 
This things are not taught enough in our schools. The new technologies that are coming out are not taught enough in our schools, not just in Nigeria, across Sub-Saharan Africa. It is important that we get people who live in this sort of communities to be part of any training and any opportunity that comes to transition from traditional agriculture, as we know it, to the new models of agriculture that take into consideration climate concerns. They should be at the forefront of it. In fact, scholarships should be given to these communities, youths in these communities, to go study those things. And this is because this is, they are the ones who live in the communities. They are the ones who are going to farm there. Right? So there is no going to bring an expert from outside of these communities to come and do the work. The other thing, intervention I'll make about this, Nemo, because you know sometimes we overfocus on the private sector, is we have to look at other non-aligned sectors. The media has an important part to play in this. How do they break down what energy this energy transition plan is? How are we teaching them to speak about it intelligently and report about it intelligently as well? Because they are the voices, people are going to listen to them on radio, newspaper, on TV, who are going to amplify what is on the, on the, on, in the plan, and then also help to hold government accountable. So there should be a media network around developing communications for what energy transition means, so that people that are listening to it on Wari Radio or whatever are able to understand and communicate to people in their indigenous languages about what it means. My last intervention will be, we also need to think about faith-based communities. I'm happy that our traditional institution is well represented here. Um, and your Royal Majesty, I'm a huge fan, by the way, I think I should say that. But, you know, we, we need to do more with these two other communities, which is the faith-based communities and our, royal, uh, our traditional institutions. Because they have moral authority, sometimes where government does not have. And so if we recognize that, that people are more inclined to trust their king or to trust their pastor or to trust their imam than they are to trust government, then we must also make sure that they are part of these conversations that we're having about what just transition would mean for their, for their constituencies. My last intervention is to the international community, especially those that give international finance. We, we are very... Um, we are at the stage where a lot of the financing that comes from um, a lot of the big donor organizations um, are sort of skewed in a way that benefits the West, that it benefits us. We want to see interventions on financing that are actually also putting in technical assistance that be benefits communities rather than benefits foreign consultants. Because those, those communities are going to be the ones who can then design or, uh, an intervention in a way that is sustainable. So that even after every foreign uh, consultant or intervention has left, has left, the people in those communities take the work forward, pass it on to their generation, and then that's where you begin to talk about the resilience, you begin to talk about the... the uh, you begin to talk about the adaptation, these things then begin to happen at a very macro level. I have more to say, Nimo, but I will stop there because I think I've answered your question. <laughs> Thank you to uh, Madam Wada and to Irene who asked the question uh, and bringing the voices of women into this conversation as well because at its very stark Energy poverty affects everybody, but it affects women the most. Energy poverty wears a woman's face, especially considering the kind of work we do in our communities and in our homes. Um, I'm bringing that, that story that Irene told into the answers that I'm going to give. It is very important that we note that, in fact, the two questions asked shows a healthy suspicion around how well this energy transition plan will work. Because we have a not so good record in Nigeria of implementing policies. We know how to draft them, but when it comes to implementing them, we have a challenge. So this is the subtext.
ask, this is the subtext of the questions that I heard from the two people who asked the question. Um, and this is now going to take me back into Nemo's question, earlier question, because I wasn't avoiding his, uh, actually I was, I was avoiding his question because the politics and debate around gas is very contentious, right? Um, but Nemo is right that, you know, using gas or having gas be the center of our energy transition policy is problematic because even though it's cleaner than all of the, so all of the other fossil that we use, it still has its own emission issues. Um, but what we're also saying, Nemo, and this is where Nemo and I fundamentally disagree about things like this. So he's very much the activist. I sit in the middle between activism and economic prosperity. And the point I, I think we should make here is how is it that countries who have been trying to stampede us into transitioning whole scale are now working back their own transition plans as a result of the energy crisis in the West. This is a question that a lot of African leaders, if you listen to all the African presidents that are speaking about just transition these days, this is the question they are asking at international forums. Why are we being asked to transition today, 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 immediately, right? When we know that we still don't have infrastructure to help us live a wholesome life like people in the West do, it's a funny question. And it's not a question that we should just sweep away or ignore. Especially in light of what has happened with the Russia-Ukraine war and how that has affected you know, a lot of the, the energy security um, um, in European countries. Um, however, however, we must still transition. Because if we, like I said earlier, this provides a great opportunity for us to build our own green energy economy. And that's why I keep saying let communities lead. Let us lead in how we're designing it, right? We can't do away with using gas. So that's, the, to go back to his question, it's a phased approach. It's a phased approach. I think gas now, the government has decided, after looking at all of the energy mixes we have, that guys, gas, being the cleanest and most available provides us a leapfrogging at, um, opportunity. My question to everybody is, should we not take it? Why should we not take it? Right? And then lastly, the other thing I was going to say about renewable energy, and I'll hand over to, to Madam Wada, is as we're thinking of using renewable energy as part of growing our energy access um, commitments, especially to reach rural, deep rural, and last mile communities. So that we don't also fall into the same trap that we're in now, let's also think about how we can begin to manufacture and assemble those renewable energy components in Nigeria. Because if your whole energy transition plan, when it comes to renewable energy, is to import them from outside the country, then you do not have a plan. It is it is critical and important that any of the international financing or even the federal government's financing and commitments that are made go into building manufacturing, solar manufacturing plants and assembly plants here in Nigeria. That is the only way, it is the only way Nigeria can get energy independence and have a clear path to building a green economy. Thank you. It's a very big debate, but you know, if they were continuing to extract fossil fuel for use in Africa, it would be one thing. But all the fossil fuels are being extracted for export. All the pipelines are going to export terminals. So, how would that? Now, you're not going to ask, I'm going to have the last word. <laughs> I don't see this integrating to our economy. It's all about feeding other people very colonial style of extraction. That's what I see. So, thank you so much. And uh, Amara, we'll hand over back to you.